probably a good idea. Right, as you probably all heard, recording is in progress. Hello to everybody. Welcome to our special uh, lecture on Tisha B'Av, as we know, coming up on Saturday night and Sunday. Last, I think it was not this Hanukkah, it was a previous Hanukkah, I think. Uh, we had Mr. Simcha Adelman giving us a talk on the history of the Seleucid Kingdom and the Hanukkah story, which was very, very interesting. And I know a lot of people came to me and said it was greatly uh, refreshing to have an idea and an understanding of uh, the historical background to Hanukkah. And they liked it very much. And they asked me to bring him again. So here we are again with Tisha B'Av, a little sadder this time, of course. Uh, and we're going to hear a bit of the history, uh, I believe, on the destruction of the first base Amikdosh. So that will give us a little bit of an understanding when we're sitting on Tisha B'Av, And it's hard to visualize the base Amikdosh and what we're missing uh, and how it all works. Uh, we'll have a little bit of an understanding. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Simi Adelman. He is the Dean of Students at the Jewish Academy. I believe that's in Hollywood, right? That is in Hollywood. That is in Hollywood and also a master's. I know I worked with him uh, uh, for a couple of years, so I know him well. So I'm going to make you the host so you can share your screen. Hold on. Let me make you the host. <laughs> right. Simi, you are now in complete control. Perfect, Rabbi. Thank you so much, Rabbi, for having me. And thank you, everyone, for the from the... Uh, Delray Orthodox Synagogue <clears throat> for having me here again. It was really a pleasure speaking last time. Um, the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, you know, as a Jew and as a historian, it's, it's just such an important and personal topic for me. So to be able to come back and help everyone have a better understanding of the first Beit HaMikdash uh, is really something special, and I thank you for the opportunity. Um, it also helped me go back and refresh on uh, an area that really I haven't uh, admittedly looked back into for a long time. Uh, what I found is that <clears throat> most of our knowledge of this time period comes from the Navi. And what I've also found is that many Jews, including, you know, Orthodox Jews, including many rabbis, don't spend a lot of time <clears throat> learning these books of Navi, the prophets, or Ketuvim, the writings, where a lot of this history is written. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into where a lot of the sources are for the and try to really go more in depth because in the uh, 45 minutes or so we have, we, there's just no way to cover it all. <clears throat> so I'm gonna share my screen and uh, God willing, it will work better than the last time. Remember we froze right in the middle. So hopefully it does not happen again. Um, <clears throat> so this is called the first Beit Mikdash and the failure of a nation. What we're gonna see is the amount of chances uh, that God gave us to, to do better and, and really, unfortunately, how, how we, you know, the Jews at that time squandered it. Now, um, similar to the uh, first lecture I gave here, I'm going to try to take a more historical approach. But uh, to quote, I believe it was Nahum Sarna's uh, term, this is going to be a little bit more of a theo-historical discussion because a lot of our knowledge of this time period is actually from... Um, <clears throat> from biblical sources. So there's a lot of really Torah ideas brought into the narrative of what happened. And interestingly enough, um, I thought that actually the vast majority of our knowledge of this time period was gonna come from Tanakh, from, from the Bible and uh, you know the biblical canon. But what I found out is there's actually a good portion of historical secular sources from that time period that also corroborate, including specific names and dates um, what we read about in the books of Jeremiah, in the books of Isaiah, and, and uh, we'll, I'll explain that a little bit further shortly. So let's go into it. So where do, we, where do we know most of our information? First and foremost, we know a lot of it from uh, the Seder Olam. The Seder Olam was written, I believe, around the time of the Gemara by the Amorayim, and it is a rabbinic account of Jewish history. <clears throat> it is really, really interesting, and there is one version, I actually have it right here, written or translated by Heinrich Guggenheimer. If you could find a copy, I highly recommend it. This is the rabbinic approach 
to Jewish history. Very, very interesting book. Uh, we also know um, some information about this time period from the Talmud, uh, from the Gemara. We know about it from the Book of Kings, uh, from the books of Chronicles, Malachim Yivayamim, from the Book of Daniel, from the Book of Ezekiel, uh, and then from the books of Jeremiah. That's where we get the most of the story from, from our Judaic sources. And then from the Chronicles of Chaldean Kings, uh, the Nebuchadnezzar Chronicle, and the Last Kings of Judah. Uh, well, the Last Kings of Judah is a secondary source that I used for this lecture, but the Nebuchadnezzar Chronicle, as well as some uh, Assyrian tablets and parchments, um, we all we can really kind of piece together a, a pretty good narrative. Um, <clears throat> one caveat is that the dates I'm giving you are um, somewhat accurate. They're very close, but because of the discrepancy in a number of different sources, I don't want to say that most of these dates are 100% accurate, but they're about 98% accurate. So you're going to get very, very close within a year or sometimes just within two to six months, um, depending on which source is reckoning the dates. So let's begin. A little bit of background. So <clears throat> Israel, as we all know and love, is right over here. This area is Israel. Now, uh, we're going to revisit another similar map a little bit later in this talk. But just to get an idea of the ancient Middle East, at this time, the great empire of the time was called Assyria, not Syria, with, with an as in front of it, Assyria. Um, to the southeast of Assyria was Babylon, which uh, I'm sure we've all heard of and we're going to learn a little bit more about later. And then to the west of the Assyrian empire was Israel. Now, if you look here, the tan orange color, that was the Assyrian empire before Tiglath's Pileser. Tiglath's Pileser, if I'm pronouncing that right, um, extended the borders once he became king. And that's when Israel got a lot more involved with the Assyrian Empire than before. <clears throat> so this is just a little bit of background. Um, the Assyrian Empire was the major empire at the time, but they always had a bit of a struggle with Babylon, as I said, to the southeast, and with Egypt, which was the previous uh, great empire before the Assyrians really started to overtake them. So at this point in time, Egypt is starting to decline. Let's keep that in mind. <clears throat> so we're not going to go through all this, but some background about Israel. Who were the kings of Israel? Was Israel one country or two? Right? What happened? There was a civil war. Let's go into that a little bit. So we had King Shaul, right? King Saul, who was eventually um, passed over for kingship, and it was then given to King David. King David ruled for many years before passing along to King Solomon. And King Solomon was the last king of a united Israel. So what happened? Solomon had a son right over here named Re Rehoboam or Rehavam. Uh, and Rehavam asked the wise old advisors, the advisors of his father, how he should rule. How should his king should be? Should it be similar to his father or should it differ? And they advised him that you should be easier than your father was, that King Shlomo, King Solomon was very tough on the Jewish people and the tax burden was very heavy and that you should lighten it so that the people will love you. And Rehavam decided he's also going to ask his friends, the young, the young college kids, right? The people younger than me, probably my age too, right? Don't ask me for advice. Ask the wise old people, right? Ask Rabbi Sanders, ask the elders, the people who really know what they're talking about. Ask them, don't ask me. So he asked his friends, and his friends said, you should be even stricter. You should be even harsher, and they should come to respect you, and they should fear you. And Rehavam said, that's a really good idea. And unfortunately, it was not a really good idea. And Rehavam, I believe the quote was, he said, my father whipped you with, I think it was chains. I'm going to whip you with scorpions. And he was even stricter than his father was. And very, very quickly, his kingdom deteriorated. Um, the Navi, with the support of the people, appointed Rehavam to Rahava, to not Rahavam, sorry, Yeravam, to Yeravam's surprise. It happened almost suddenly in a field. He was not expecting it. And Yeravam became the next king of Israel. So the kingdom, right, which was ruled by Shlomo, then split with Rahavam ruling the southern kingdom that was comprised of the tribe of Yehuda and Benjamin, uh, Judah and Benjamin. And the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, or the kingdom of the 10 tribes, right? So you have the northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. Judah was comprised of Judah and, um, and uh, Benjamin, and also contained the capital, Yerushalayim, 
Jerusalem with the Beit HaMikdash. This is going to be very, very important later. Um, the Beit HaMikdash was in the kingdom of Rehavah. Yeruvim controlled the 10 northern tribes and those on the Transjordan who were on the eastern side. <clears throat> now, what ended up happening was that Yeruvim, instead of being a righteous ruler appointed by the prophet and by the people, decided that he wanted more power for himself. And he realized that the Jews, three times a year minimum, have to travel to the Beit HaMikdash. They have to travel to the temple for the three holidays, right? For, for Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. But also, they would go constantly to the Beit HaMikdash to give sacrifices. There were all these different types of offerings to pray to God. This was the center of Jewish life. The Beit HaMikdash, right? right why, why do we call the um, synagogues, right? The small Beit HaMikdash is the Beit HaMikdash Ma'at, the small, the small uh, um, temples. We don't call them temples, right? Not, not the Orthodox, but we call the Beit Knesset, house of gathering. Because the Beit HaMikdash was a gathering place. This is where the Jews would unite and, and serve Hashem, serve God. And he couldn't be having his subjects constantly going to his rival kingdom and being a part of it. And who would sit in the middle of the Beit HaMikdash? There was the throne of the king. So how does it look when the Sanhedrin, the head court, and the king is sitting right in the temple and the opposing rival king subjects are constantly seeing them on a daily basis? It looks very, very bad. So what did Yeravam do to remedy this? He set up guards who would block the Jews from visiting Jerusalem anymore. And he created two golden calves, a golden calf by the tribe of Dan. And, I, and another one, I forgot exactly which tribe it was in, but it was a calf all the way in the northmost side of the kingdom. And then there was a calf on the southmost, southmost side of the kingdom. So that way, no matter where you were in the northern kingdom, uh, if you were towards the southern tip or towards the northern tip, you would be able to give sacrifices to God using these fake Kohanim, these fake priests, to this fake idol. And this was somehow some sort of worship of Hashem. At least it was supposed to be. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, it was, it's beyond the scope of this discussion to go into why it is that um, Yeravam thought it would be a good idea to take one of the worst episodes of Jewish history, the golden calf, and build two of them and think that this was a good idea. It is beyond the scope of the discussion. Perhaps Rabbi Sanders, I don't mean to be on the spot, Rabbi, but if you want to maybe, maybe for a Shabbos year around Kitsisa or something, but, but there's, there's some very interesting discussion to be had there. But what ended up happening was, and it's recorded in the prophets in the book of Malachim, the book of Kings, that the Jews on the southernmost tip of the Northern Kingdom would travel all the way to the idol at the top. And the Jews at the top would travel all the way to the idol at the bottom to put in so much effort into worshiping these calves. They were very, very into this idol worship, which obviously is going to spell disaster, as we know uh, from Jewish history. Uh, they, the Gemara records that the first Beit HaMikdash was destroyed uh, chiefly because of idol worship. <clears throat> and uh, idol worship, uh, you know, I idol worship is, is one of the most severe sins in Judaism. And we're going to see it becomes very, very rampant. So that is when the kingdom split. Now, ideally, the kingdom was really only intended to split for 30 years, according to the Navi, around 30 years or so. But because of the sins of the northern kingdom, it remained split. Well, partially because of the sins of the northern kingdom, it remained split forever. <clears throat> we're going to fast forward a little bit. We see the red were the different kings of uh, Israel, while the green were the kings of Judah. The kings of Judah had tended to have considerably longer rules than that of Israel. The kings of Israel also did not really come, I don't think ever, from the house of David. So they were never really legitimate rulers, um, <clears throat> or only by slight relation, I think a couple of them. And we're going to see as we get towards the bottom kings right over here, this is where we're really going to focus um, that some of the kings ruled for no more than just one month. Uh, so what ends up happening is over here, you have Ahab, the king of Israel, uh, Ahab marries a non-Jewish queen or princess, Isabel or Jezebel, uh, and Jezebel convinces Ahab to commit many atrocities, including the slaughter of hundreds of prophets. The only reason that many prophets were saved is because a hundred of them were saved by Ahab's, one of his head servants, Ovadia, who he himself, uh, I believe, later became a prophet as well. So fast forward in time, 
You have a series of good kings and bad kings of Israel. You have uh, Menashe, who was one of the worst. You have Hiskiah, who was father, who was one of the best. Uh, you have uh, Sidkiah, who was somewhat good. Yoshiah, was somewhat good. So you have these good and the not so good kings of Judah. And then amongst the kings of Israel, they were almost entirely bad. Uh, and one of the most common phrases that I noticed when going through the book of Kings is that uh, by every king, but as the, as the chronicler records um, his death, the death of each king, it says that they continued in the sins of Yeravan ben Nebat, the initial king who set up the idols. Even the kings that tried to do better from the kings of Israel, they still never destroyed the idols of Yeravan and are faulted for continuing on this chain of idol worship that only increased, right? Jezebel, uh, who I think was from Sidon, she brought in uh, this nature god uh, and Ashtarot trees um, and other types of nature worship. So the Jews were continually, especially in the Northern Kingdom, adding on to these different pantheons and gods from all these other nations. So this is the background to the whole story. This is the background from a more historical perspective from how the Jews were acting at the time. And now we're gonna lead into this second part. We're gonna fast forward about a hundred and something years here. So let's talk quickly about the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, the Beit HaMikdash was built by Shlomo HaMelech in the year 1000 BCE. It was the house of God. It was the structure that God said that he would rest his presence onto. It was the center of Jewish life. And this is a fairly accurate rendition of the first Beit HaMikdash. The end of an era. So if we were to go back for one second to our, that's not going back. If we go back, we're going to start with Zechariah, who is right over here. Zechariah or Zechariah is right over here. So we're getting towards the end of the kings of Israel. <clears throat> he was in charge. He ruled for only six months. He was killed by the captain of his army, Shalom. Shalom then ruled for only one month before being killed by the captain of his army, Menachem. Now, Menachem was one of the last kings of Israel, the last long ruling king of Israel. He ruled for 10 years. Um, there was a nation that did not help, there was not a nation, there was a city in Israel that did not help him ascend the throne. They refused to open the gates for him. And so he destroyed the city uh, and all of the men, women, and children who were in it. These were Jews. Um, he began a relationship with Assyria, who became gradually stronger <clears throat> um, and became a tributary state who was giving money to Assyria in exchange for them not attacking them. He was succeeded by his son, Pekahia, who ruled for a very short amount of time. Um, Pekahia was killed almost immediately by Pekah, just, you know, coincidental to names, who then ruled for 20 years. Um, he allied with Rezin, who was the king of Aram, and the combined army. So again, Aram was a border country of Israel that was also under the Assyrian Empire. And Aram and <coughs> the northern kingdom wanted to be free of Syrian control. They wanted to be free of not having to pay them money. So to try to free themselves of this external As Assyrian threat, the Northern Kingdom and Rezin decided that they wanted to try to ally with the king of Israel at the time. Um, but the king of Israel refused to join their alliance. He did not think it was a good idea and he did not want any part of it. Uh, in return, though, Pekahia and Rezin attacked the Southern Kingdom. According to the Seder Olam, 200,000 women and children were captured and brought to the Northern Kingdom. But the prophet Oded brought a message of God to Pekahia to release them and to not have any more part in this, which he listened. And he released the women and children unharmed and they returned back to Judah. The exile of the 10 tribes. <clears throat> Hoshea was the last king of Israel. He was an officer in Pekah's army. And if you can see the pattern that's developed, he assassinated Pekah. Right? I think they say, I don't know who said it, but violence begets violence. We see that a lot of these illegitimate rulers who killed then became, killed themselves by officers of their own army. So you had a, a long series 
of um, usurpers in the kingdom of Israel, unappointed by the people and unappointed by God, which are the two requirements of the Jewish king that have to be appointed by God, and they have to be appointed and accepted by the people. <clears throat> he paid tribute to, uh, as a vassal king to Tiglat Pleser III. Tiglat Pleser III was the one who extended the borders, which we'll see a little bit later. That was the green towards the edges. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and Hoshea saw the, the uselessness in trying to fight it. So he would raise huge sums of money in order to prevent uh, himself from getting into um, any trouble with them. Uh, Tiglat eventually died and his successor, Shalmanasser, um, became the next king. Now, Hoshea, who was tired of having to pay tribute to Shalmanasser, uh, sent messages to Egypt to try to ally against them. Egypt, who, did not, who also did not like the Assyrian Empire becoming so powerful, said that they would help, but they lied. They did not help, I believe. I want to say it's in the book of Yeshayahu, but I, I don't recall exactly. Um, but there's a quote where God describes Egypt as a reed that if you lean upon it, it's going to snap and it's going to pierce your shoulder. Do not lean on it. They were a broken snake. God already said he, he threw his prophet that the uh, that Egypt was was no not going to ever rise to what they were when we were enslaved there. That they were going to be on a slow and steady decline, and this had already happened. Egypt was historically nowhere near as powerful as they previously were, and they were not supposed to be relied on. Now, <coughs> excuse me. After not getting support, they did not stand a chance. The Assyrian king uh, marched into Israel and he exiled the northern kingdom in 720 BCE. So remember, the Beit HaMikdash was built 1000 BCE. Um, the kingdom split sometime after that. Uh, and now the northern kingdom of Israel was exiled in 720 BCE. During this time period, just to put in perspective, Chizkiyahu, uh, the king of Judah, was the king around the time of the exile. <clears throat> Fall of the Assyrian Empire. So now back to the history for a second. So this is the Assyrian Empire um, during, or as I said, at its great extent, right? During the time after the borders had already spread into Egypt, over Judah, over <coughs> Aram, right? The allies we spoke about earlier and over Babylonia. Um, the rule at the time was Tukultin, Ninurta, again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, he extended Assyrian borders even further, subjugated Babylon, who remained under the strict control, control of Assyria for about 32 years. Uh, Tiglat Pleser, who we discussed, expanded the empire to the west, though he lost some of the eastern lands to the Arameans. Um, his successor was Sancheru, who's mentioned fairly frequently in Jewish scripture. Uh, his successor, Sancheriv, sacked Babylon, um, but over time, they were unable to keep Babylon subjugated, and Babylon with the Medes, right, the Medes were the ones who later conquer Babylon with the Persians, um, they managed to uh, overtake Assyria. With Assyria overtaken, the Babylonians rise to become the biggest threat or one of the biggest threats in the Middle Eastern area. So who comes next on this stage, right? We have this in the, in the non-Jewish world, in the Middle East, we have very turbulent times. Egypt's declining. Assyria, which was the great power for so many years, is starting to decline. You have Babylon, which was subjugated for so many years, coming up under the powerful rule of Nebuchadnezzar. And the Egypt and the Jewish kingdom is getting weaker and weaker. The 10 tribes of the Northern Kingdom were already exiled. Uh, some of them were, went to the surrounding non-Jewish lands. The rest of them were lost, and we don't, we don't know where they went. Um, it says that God, and I don't know how, you know, I don't know exactly what this means. It's, it's, it seems to be fairly figurative, that God created like this giant river and just kind of cut them off. So whatever exactly that means, ultimately the, the uh, 10 tribes were lost to history. And to this day, we, we don't really know uh, what happened exactly. So... On the stage comes Yirmiyahu, the prophet. He was the second of the what they call the, the, the big prophets, the large prophets. Um, you had, starting with Yeshayahu, with, uh, with uh, Isaiah, 
And then you have Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, who is the leading prophet soon after him. He was the author of Sefer Malachim and of Sefer Yirmiyahu and of Sefer Echa. Echa is, of course, uh, Lamentations, which we're going to be reading um, Saturday night. Um, he wrote this with the assistance of his servant and scribe, Baruch, uh, who plays a little bit of a role a little bit later in this, in this story as well. He was known as the Weeping Prophet. Uh, he had an extremely, extremely sad and difficult life. There's, there's a story of when the people captured him and they threw him in a mud pit and he was going to drown before being, slay, before being saved by uh, a servant of the king who saw him being drowned and, and rescued him from the uh, mud puddle. He was, he, was subjugate, he was really persecuted a lot. The Jews did not want to hear his message. You can imagine someone coming around, a doomsayer, coming around to all the synagogues saying how terrible all the Jews are and that everything we're doing is bad and, you know, we're going to suffer by the hands of God. Nobody wants to hear that message, right? It takes, you know, a righteous person to properly listen to and be able to absorb rebuke. And the Jews at this time, unfortunately, were very far from that and they did not want to hear what he had to say. Uh, and he was persecuted heavily for it. And when he complained and he cried out to God about his persecution, God said that it's only going to get worse. And it did. Uh, he was also the prophet of destruction because he was the one who started after Isaiah really prophesying about the imminent destruction of the Beit HaMikdash and of Judea and of the 10 tribes of Israel if nobody was willing to change. Uh, but they didn't heed his call and he was alive for the destruction. Um, <clears throat> to quote the book of Jeremiah, uh, a few different sins that were happening at the time. They were worshiping foreign gods, right? We have the Asherah trees, they have the Baal, uh, as well as a host of other different deities, the golden calves that they were worshiping, either in addition to and oftentimes a replacement of God. Um, the uh, book of Jeremiah says that they sacrificed children to the Baal. Um, they were burning them in fire, horrible, horrible um, types of worship that are really disgusting to God and even to modern sensibilities, even even any non-Jew would say that that's, that's a horrible thing to do. The priests were very greedy and not following proper procedures in the temple. Um, and God beseeches the northern kingdom to return. Jeremiah, this is before the, the destruction of the northern kingdom. God sends Jeremiah um, <clears throat> prophecies to tell the northern kingdom that even though they backtrack, backtracked, even though they have slipped, that God is willing to forgive them all they have to do is admit their transgressions and resolve to not do it anymore. But unfortunately, they do not listen and they do not listen to his words. On to the kingdom of Judah. King Yoshiahu of Judah, he was a righteous king. He tried to restore the worship of Hashem, but unfortunately, his, his uh, early ancestors like King Menashe and all the damage he did, all of the, the uh, destruction of holy, of, of just the destruction of Torah study and holiness that Menashe brought um, onto, uh, onto Israel. It just made it impossible for Yoshiahu to really completely free the Jews of their idol worshiping ways and go back to only worshiping Hashem. But during this time period is when the Assyrian empire started to fall and uh, he took advantage of the situation to annex parts of the former northern kingdom of Israel to make it part of Judea. Um, he ended up, though, while annexing parts of Judea, um, running into the army of ne Necho of Egypt, or Necho of Egypt, <clears throat> and uh, he ends up being killed in battle, and Necho uh, appoints his uncle, Jehoiakim, in his place. So again, he the Assyrian Empire begins to crumble with Babylon rising in the east. Egypt is trying to save their now ally because they're both weaker and they want to stop Babylon from the south. And then also from the middle south, not as south as Egypt, but not as high as Aram, was Israel, who's trying to annex northern lands. Um, so he dies in battle to Nico, who then appoints Jehoiakim in his place as a vassal. So that means Jehoiakim is going to have to pay Nico money in return for whatever level of power he gets. I, I, I don't know if you guys are seeing the same thing I'm seeing. I'm hoping that my, this thing is not uh, blocking the pictures. So I'm going to minimize just in case it is. 
Um, but what happens is Babylon defeats the Assyrian Egyptian alliance. Yirmiyahu, right, Jeremiah advises the king Jehoiakim to submit to Babylon. He says that it is the wise thing to do. There's no point in trying to fight against them and not to rely on Egypt, who again was very unreliable and broken at the time. Unfortunately, Yirmiyahu, uh, uh, Jehoiakim does not listen to Yirmiyahu and rebels instead. Um, the way it's recorded is that, um, um, oops, sorry. Uh, and what's depicted in this picture is the king throwing the scroll with Yirmiyahu's message into the fire. Yirmiyahu had a prophecy and told Baruch his scribe to write down the scroll, bring the scroll to the town center and preach it, tell it to the Jews in the center. So while Baruch is relaying Yirmiyahu's message, um, the king's uh, officers find out and they bring Baruch to them and Baruch and Yirmiyahu read the message to the king and his people. The king takes the scroll he cuts it up with a razor and he throws it in the fire, even though many of his officers, while they were undisturbed by the really horrible warning of Yirmiyahu about what's going to happen uh, with the destruction, the officer still thought it was the wrong thing to do to destroy it, but the king did not care. And he burns the scroll. The, 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 uh, scroll. the king and the Judean kingdom rebel against Babylon, uh, who ended up overtaking, as I said, Assyria and Egypt. Uh, they are even because they're a little bit weaker because of the war. He feels that this is going to be a good time to rebel, and that's what he does. But as Yirmiyahu prophesied, uh, that was not a good idea. <clears throat> Babylon conquers Judea and was what I call at least the first sack of Jerusalem. This is the first time Nebuchadnezzar attacked Yerushalayim. He exiled the nobles and the craftsmen to Babylon. Um, so the the wealthy people, the noble people. The you know, useful people, the ones who knew how to make weapons, important merchants were all exiled to Babylon. Yirmiyahu sends a message to those Jews in Babylon to start making themselves comfortable and to not despair because God is going to bring them back. And uh, it was, that was supposed to happen 70 years later. Um, now, uh, Nebuchadnezzar captures and kills Yehoiakim, who rebelled against him, and he appoints Sidkiyahu in his place. There is a very, very important law in Judaism called Shemitah. You might be familiar with this. Shemitah is a law that every seven years, you're not, the, you're not allowed to work the land anymore. But there's some other important things that happen during the Shemitah year. One of them is that the Jewish slaves, Ebed Ibrahim, right, Jewish indentured servants, must be let free. Um, the only case where this is not true or not, not, the, not, not true, but not the case is where they decide to go through a ritual where they get their ear pierced and declare that they want to remain a slave. But there's a maximum amount of time that you're allowed to be a slave because really God does not intend Jews to be slaves. Jews are not supposed to be slaves. You should be a servant to God. You should not serve another man. It's not a good idea. Um, and this is, <coughs> this is called the Yovel year, the Yovel year, the Jubilee year is every 50 years. So after seven cycles of seven years, the 50th year, all slaves must go free. Now, unfortunately, the Jews stopped following this practice and they did not allow the Jews to go free during the 50th year. They were not freeing their slaves. And when God sent a prophecy about the destruction, how terrible this act was, the Jews Created, they recreated the famous covenant, the Brit Ben Habitarim, the covenant between the parts, where Abraham cut in, at some animals in half and he walked through them and made a covenant with God about his commitment to Hashem and Hashem's commitment to Abraham. And the Jews, in a very emotional and moving and meaningful, seemingly, um, attempt to recreate this ritual, did the same thing. And on the, after doing this covenant with God, this recreation of the breach of Tarim, they freed all of their slaves, all the noblemen and the king agreed to release all the slaves of the kingdom. And that's exactly what they did. And then very, very quickly turned around, recaptured all the slaves and took them right back. This was such an affront to God that God had really at this point, uh, you know, the Jews really sealed their fate with that. That was such an affront to God. And it seemed very, very intentional. 
as well. <clears throat> the reason I'm telling you this is so that we could get a good understanding of the mindset of the people at this time, why maybe they weren't so keen on listening to Jeremiah and why Jeremiah had to continually give all these messages. <coughs> against the advice of Yirmiyahu, again, Sidkiyahu rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. He throws Yirmiyahu in jail for treason. Uh, Yirmiyahu was constantly trying to preach that we should make peace with Babylon, who again at the time was the enemy after Sidkiyahu's rebellion. So <clears throat> he did not take too kindly to a at least somewhat respected prophet amongst those who were not persecuting him. You know, preaching, run away, run away. Whenever the siege lets up, run, surrender yourselves to, to Babylon. That did not go off so well, and he was thrown in prison. <clears throat> this is where we get towards the end, the Babylonian exile. The reason, <clears throat> one of the reasons, the first main, second main reason why we mourn on Tisha B'Av. <clears throat> in 588 BCE, the siege of Jerusalem begins. Uh, during the siege, there were times where the Jews had opportunities to surrender, um, which they did not take, but many listened to Yirmiyahu, uh, who encouraged them to run to the walls and flee to the Babylonian captors and surrender themselves, which they did. Nebuchadnezzar allowed many of them to live, and they were exiled to Babylon. Sidkiyahu tried to escape from an underground tunnel, but he was captured. His uh, children were killed in front of him, and then they blinded him and brought him to Babylon, where I believe he remained until Nebuchadnezzar's son uh, later let him go free, and uh, he lived the rest of his life in Babylon. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into any more details than that. I think it was enough, but Sidkiyahu did not have a very good life in Babylon. Uh, the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed in 586 BCE, about 400 years after its construction. The Jews from the 10 tribes who managed to escape to some of the surrounding lands were exiled. Nebuchadnezzar comes across Yirmiyahu, who was rotting away in jail, um, uh, frees him, and he gives him a choice. If he wants to go not as a servant or as a as one who's captured, uh, a captive, but if he wants to go as an honored guest uh, to live in Babylon with the king, or if he would like to remain in Israel. And Yirmiyahu chooses to live amongst the Jews of Israel, and he remains in Israel with the poor Jews who are left. <clears throat> and appointed over these poor Jews as governor is Gedalia ben Achikam. Gedalia was a tzaddik, he was a very, very holy person, and he ruled very well uh, over the remaining Jews of Judea. Um, he was a righteous ruler. They lived in relative autonomy. They obviously had to follow politically uh, the, the rule of the Babylonians. However, when it came to practicing their religion, they were really unbothered. It was very similar to, if you remember, the Second Temple period, where the Greek, after uh, Yehuda Maccabee made peace with the Greeks, the Greeks allowed them to follow their religion. They were just technically under the Greek rule. Um, which, you know, there's much worse situations than that. Um, so that was what, how the Jews were living. But Ishmael ben Netanya, uh, Ishmael, who was actually a descendant of the house of David, was very jealous that Gedalia got to be the emperor, not, I'm sorry, not the emperor, that he got to be the, the governor of the Jews. He felt that it should be him, even though we're talking a very small, poor Jewish population. Ishmael conspires with 10 men to kill Gedalia, which they successfully do. They assassinate Gedalia and many of Gedalia's retinue <clears throat> and capture many more before realizing that this rebellion is futile, that by killing Gedalia, they've really just only killed themselves. Um, and the Yirmiyahu, uh, Ishmael basically takes Yirmiyahu, who's still alive at this time, Baruch the scribe and the rest of the Jews, and they all flee to Egypt before you know, the wrath of the Babylonians come down on them for killing, um, killing uh, Nebuchadnezzar's appointee. So <clears throat> that ends the Jewish presence in Israel. Uh, the Rambam describes Gedalia as the ember of Israel, that, that the ember of Israel was extinguished when Gedalia was killed. Just like a small ember is enough to relight a raging fire, so too was Gedalia. Gedalia and Yirmiyahu and Baruch, these holy tzaddikim, were able to 
keep the the fire of Israel alive within Judea, within the land of Israel. But with Gedaliah's murder, um, we had to run. And that might also answer the question for anyone who's wondering, why do we fast for Gedaliah? Why, why Gedaliah specifically? What was so great about him? While Gedaliah was very, you know, great and holy individual, it was, he was the last hope. And it's very sad, even, even just, you know, right now, I'm just, I feel very sad, you know, even just saying it. But Gedali was, he was the last hope of Israel and he was killed by, by his fellow Jews. And that was it. And that with that, the, the Jewish life in Israel was almost completely uh, no more. That was the end of it. <clears throat> so to recap the events, what I was mentioning earlier about the mercy of God and how he gave us so many chances over literally hundreds of years to do better before the complete exile of the Jewish people. We had the split of the kingdom, which was supposed to be temporary until the golden calves were erected and made it permanent. You had Yisabel who hunted down and killed scores of prophets. You had the widespread idol worship of both the uh, kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south. And all throughout this time, you had prophets warning the Jews, God beseeching the Jews, please turn around, come back to God, come back to Hashem, and you could, you could end this. When God gives a prophecy of something good, this is a general rule, I think it's spoken about in the Gemara. When God gives a prophecy for something good, it always happens. When it's for something negative, there's a way to avert it. And the Jews were given the chance to avert it, but they didn't avert it. They got generation after generation of warning before the northern kingdom was exiled. After the northern kingdom was exiled, you had the two failed rebellions of the Judean kingdom, of the southern kingdom of Judea. Um, after those failed rebellions, you had Gedaliah, the last remaining leader of the Jewish people, who was assassinated, and then Yermiahu and Baruch, as well as the rest of the remaining Jews, had to go um, to Babylon, where they remained until, uh, you know, the story of Purim, which we're all familiar with, uh, who eventually, uh, you know, Koresh, Cyrus, as well as um, <clears throat> his, his successor, allowed the Jews to return to Israel and rebuild the Beit HaMikdash, which, you know, we know what ends up happening there. But um, I think I, look, look at that, right on time, a good 45 minutes. Uh, I want to make sure to keep it that time. So we got at least a good basic knowledge. Um, I strongly encourage anyone to, you know, who has the time, open up the book of Kings, the book of Jeremiah, really read the details of the, the uh, siege of Jerusalem and the siege of uh, Samaria and the different, uh, the different cities of Israel, which is talked about in the book of Lamentations. Look at the Seder Olam, really try to understand in even more depth uh, some of these events. But this is an overall history of the events of the first Beit HaMikdash. So I want to make sure to leave some time if anybody has any questions. Um, Rabbi, are they able to unmute themselves or do I have to unmute them? Uh, no, we're going to have to unmute them. Okay, so, uh, anyone, I'm going if there's a mass unmute, I will mass unmute everyone. Um, I don't think there's a way to do that. All right, give me one second. I will just, do you know how to unmute everyone? I can't. Yes, I, I've now clicked the button that is allowing <laughs> participants to unmute themselves. So anybody who wants to unmute themselves should be able to unmute themselves. If anybody wants to unmute and ask a question, uh, anybody want to ask any questions? Last chance. Any questions? No. It should be that you're able to unmute yourself. So basically, we started this whole... Ah. This, excuse me. Yes. The, the siege on uh, Tisha B'Av or... So the siege started, the, the siege was actually about two years, depending on the source that we go by for dating it. It was about a two-year-long siege. They broke through the walls of Jerusalem on the 17th of Tammuz. That's why we have the fast day. And during that three-week period, they managed to capture the rest of Yerushalayim. And on Tisha B'Av, the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. So Tisha B'Av was destroyed, but the siege uh, was a two-year-long siege, and they broke through on the 17th of Tammuz. Okay, now is this the instance where it uh, burned for a day and a half? So we go, we um, we're in mourning till sometime on the tenth of Av, or is that for the second uh, Beit Hamikdash? Where's 
Well, uh, ask that one more time. I don't think I heard you right. Yes, we, well, we, we finish uh, the morning stuff, let us say, okay, on the 10th. At right. Uh, so, okay. So this, the uh, actual burning, whatever, is that, uh, that lasted a day and a half, if you want to talk that way, was on, is that for the first temple or the second temple? That, that's a great question. I'm going to defer to Rabbi Sanders. Rabbi, do you have the answer to that one? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. But I know it definitely refers to the second temple because the Gemara says it was the second temple. I have no idea when the first temple was burning. I'm not sure if it was the night or the morning. Okay. A great question. Very good question. Very good question. Any other questions? Yeah. No, nobody else has any questions? Okay, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Reb Simcha for this wonderful lecture. It certainly was very enlightening to me and so on. And uh, we're very grateful. We'll have to get you back again sometime uh, to discuss some other historical uh, uh, ideas. So thank you so much. Just to remind everybody that the fast is going to start in Delray Beach at 8.15 on Shabbat. So we're going to fast the last bit of Shabbat. And then we have Mariv at 9.15 p.m. after Shabbat. Shabbos, you can come, take your shoes off, change your clothes out of your Shabbat clothes uh, and come to shul. And then on <laughs> Sunday, if it's not too much to remember, we've got it on email. We are going to daven at the later time of 8.30. Because by the time we finish late and on Saturday night, it gives people time not to rush up on a fast day. So 8.30, we're going to daven shakris uh, and a little bit of an explained kinnas. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>